Hello, my name is Bill Haley, and this is for Haley 2024, the movement's government reform ideas. Now, this one's going to be on securing the U.S. Constitution from open immigration and fringe groups. So, we, our amendment process is not as secure as it should be right now. So, I have another video out there that's going to be six minutes long. I have another one in about 55 minutes, I believe it is. And this one, I'm going to target about 25 minutes. Go a little bit more in depth, take a breath, and go over, over everything nice, nicely. So let's go over it. We, need want, we want to secure the U.S. Constitution from the amendment process from fringe groups or open immigration. It's too vulnerable right now. We'll go over why that is. So how many people does it take to amend the U.S. Constitution? Would you believe it could be done with 10 million? I think if we use the right strategy, it could be done with as low as 1% or 3 million, maybe 4 million people. It could definitely have a good go at it at least. 5 million, much better chances going to 10 million. I think we start overwhelming the um, process. So, what needs to happen to amend the Constitution? Well, Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution is where the amendment process is. And it has two ways to propose. 30% of the, I mean 60% of the Congress or 60% of the states. 60% of the states means that's 30 states. 30 of the 50. So, 30 states need to propose it. Now, you only need a simple majority in, in each of the state legislatures, each of the 30 state legislatures, to propose it. Then it gets sent, once 30 propose it, it gets sent to the, um, all the states, and only 38 states, 75%, need to ratify it. Again, only a simple majority need to ratify it. So 51%. Of each of the states, 51% of Alaska, 51% of um, um, North Dakota, 51% of Wyoming needs to um, amend it. So, of the 38 states, now we're going to concentrate on the 38 least populated states. There's no reason to go after California, New York, Texas, Florida, and the like. We're going to go after the 38 less, least populated states. So, 66 million people, or 21% or of the Americans, live in the 51% of the districts of the 38 least populated states. Look it up online, do your own numbers. 66 million, out of the, we have about 330 million people in the United States. But only 66 million people live in 21% of them, or 21% of Americans, live in the 51%, the majority of the districts of the 38 least populated states. Highly important that you understand each um, cat caveat there. So 21, 20 million or 6% of Americans voted in 2018 in the districts needed to amend the U.S. Constitution. Here are the 12 states, if you can look at it, um, if you can zoom in, that, zoom in enough to see this. 60% of Americans live in the top 12 states, population-wise. 60%. 40%, obviously, live in the 38 states, the least populated states. So we don't even worry about it. 60% of the country is now eliminated from the amendment process. Not only 60% of the uh, states, I mean, not only 60% of the Americans... The 40% that's, that's left, we only go with 20% because we only go after a slight majority of the districts. Again, 51% of each state legislatures, each of the 38 state legislatures, are needed. Not 51% of 38 states, 51% of each of the state's legislatures. So 51% of Wyoming, 51% of um, South Carolina, 51% of Georgia, that kind of stuff. So in 2016, the numbers were a little bit bigger, turnout levels, but we're going to go after the um, off-year elections, the non-presidential elections. But it's still, 79 million people voted in 12 states in 2016, 57 million voted in the 38 states. So we're going to concentrate all our efforts on 38 states. I say we, there's going to be nefarious forces that want to do this for bad amendments. I want to do it for good amendments. 
I want to do this to amend the Constitution, amend the amending process of the Constitution, or if we can get a couple good ones in there before we do this, that'd be fine too. 51% of the districts of these 38 states is 20 to 30 million voters. 30 for the presidential year, 20 for the 2018 year. Then to get a um, simple majority to win each election, 10 to 15 million people. So move 10 million people. Highly important word is move people. We're not going to just going to try to go and motivate the people who live in these districts to vote a certain way. We're going to move people to start overwhelming elections. Make shift businesses and do different things to get people there, pay people to move, um, saying that there's going to be a business there, get people there, double up in houses, whatever the case may be. There's a lot of strategy in that. We'll go over that. We did that, a lot of that in the longer video. but We might get a little bit into it on this video as well. But we're going to move people. And... We can bus people in, register to vote, say they're at the homeless shelter, whatever, move them back to go vac vacation back at their parents' house or back at college where they live, and then come back and um, vote during the elections or mail in the votes. A lot of different ways to do it. So, how many districts do you need to amend the Constitution? I forget the exact number, but I believe it's eight or, eight or nine um, thousand state legislative districts in America. All you need to amend the Constitution is 2,725. 2,725. That's 1,980. 1,980 on the lower house. 745 on the state senates. That's 38 states. That's a simple majority. And those overlap, by the way. So we're going to concentrate on um, about the 2,000 lower house districts. Give a little bit of margin of error. So we're going to move people an average of 5,000 per lower house district. Now these districts have wildly different um, sizes on population. Some are um, much larger, some are much smaller. Again, we're not talking about California, New York, Texas. Those are already eliminated. We're not going after them. But some of the bigger states within the 38, Georgia, uh, Virginia, whatever, uh, they, they have a little bit larger districts per um legislative seat. But state senate here is 12,500. Again, this is based off of 10 million people, 2,000 districts that we need to concentrate on because they overlap with the state senates. So 2,000 districts, 5,000 people per. So in 2018, it took 5,000 on average to win each legislative district on average. We're going to use strategy. We're going to, we have a lot of things we can do to use strategy to get those numbers way down. But let's go with this. Competitive primaries is about 1,500. You can do a lot better study than I did. I looked at several of the um, big races, competitive primaries, and still you split between Republicans and Democrats. And you have the, um, then you have a lot lower turnout. But if you move 5,000 people per um, district, and 1,500, 3,000 3, people vote in a primary per district, 1,500 to win a primary, 5,000 is definitely going to overwhelm that by three times as much. So you can move 1% or 3.3 3 million people spread over 2,000 districts. And that's 1,676 per district, which is a little bit more than what's needed to win a primary. Let's keep on going. Let me state it flat out. 1% or 3.3 3 million Americans could win most primaries in the legislative districts needed to amend the U.S. Constitution. It's highly important to know. So 2% or 6.7 million could, give a, could overwhelm a primary and start becoming very competitive in a general election. 3% or 10 million Americans, that's 5,000 per district, overwhelms primaries. Three times the number of um, people needed to win. One, one, uh, one and a half times as many people that even vote in a normal primary, on a competitive primary. And that's going to win 90% 90, 90 plus of the general elections. 
So it's important to know that we're going to move 10 million people to these districts. The str we're going to have a lot of strategy on the other longer video. I went over a lot more on that. But we're going to run as Democrats or re Republicans on normal platforms. Get people known in their community, active in their community. It's not going to um, surprise anybody that these people actually run because we're going to get them out there making speeches, writing, getting on news, advertising, getting their name out there, becoming part of the either the Tea Party or the Republican Party or the Democrat Party, Libertarian Party. Get them out there saying normal stuff and getting out there and being part of the community. What's some of the bad amendments that could happen with this? What if we got rid of the Second Amendment and replaced it with an amendment saying there's a 100% gun ban? That's pretty radical. What if people um, said, hey, come over and help us move to these areas, move to these districts I need you to go to, to address climate change? And that's all they say. A lot of people want to address climate change, but that's all they say. But what if they came in and said, we want to do a 100% fossil fuel ban and did that by constitutional amendment, devastating the economy, devastating our way of life, devastating, the, in my opinion, devastating the um, environment. What if um, people were running on the uh, socialized medicine or Medicaid for all? A lot of people are getting elected on that right now, but they chose to go a little bit farther and go full socialism by constitutional amendment, U.S. constitutional amendment. Open immigration. There's a thousand scenarios where it could be really bad, but 1% of China is 15 million people. I said that 3, 3 million might be able to devastate, I mean, wreak havoc in our primary system. Five, uh, 10 million could easily, well, win most general elections. What if 1% of China is 15 million people? What if they send over as much as 2 million? I mean, I'm sorry, 2% or 30 million Chinese people. That's 2%, 30 million people. Overwhelms these districts. And they just write a constitutional amendment saying that America chooses to be part of China under the rule of the Chinese dictator. Why, why couldn't they do that if we had open immigration? How easy of a tactic is it to give our enemy? Radical Islamic terrorists, ISIS types, not all Muslims by no means, but there's 1.5 billion Muslims in the world, worldwide, not concentrated in any one area. A lot in the Middle East, Indonesia, very little in the United States. But if we had open immigration, then that means there's nothing stopping 15, 20, or 30 million, one to two percent of Muslims who want Sharia law, who want full Sharia law, who want the prize of America, America's wealth, America's might, and to say because of their religious belief that um, all Americans should live under Sharia law. Women are subjugated. Men are killed, women are stoned. We're talking not just normal Muslims, not what maybe 80% of Muslims wouldn't do this, but would 2% do it? Go full Sharia law? I think those numbers are overwhelmingly true. What if Mexico said, I want California and um, Texas back? And they just sent over 15 million people instead of concentrating them in Texas and California like they do now, move them to the districts. Get buses, move them to the districts. Say they live in homeless shelters. Do what they have to for three or four months to make it by. Vote. Vote in their people and amend the Constitution saying We're, we took over Texas and, and California and for good measure. Why not just have the president of uh, Mexico take over all of America and say, by constitutional amendment, we join Mexico under the leadership of Mexico? Could happen. China has about 1.4 billion people. The Muslim population has 1.5 billion people worldwide. So 1% of that, again, is 15 million, 14 to 15 million people. 
Can we trust Putin not to meddle in our elections? What have we been talking about for the last two, three or four years? How Russia meddled in our election. Regardless of whether that's true or not true, or to what degree it was true. How easy would it be? How easy would it have been in the Cold War under Gorbachev or the previous leaders of the Soviet Union? If we had open, if we allowed open immigration just to send over 15, 20 million people. Back then, the population was lower. 10 million people would have overwhelmed what was needed to amend the Constitution. Saying, by constitutional amendment, America is a uh, satellite state of the USSR. Why couldn't they have done that legally? And they took all our military might, all our aircraft carriers, all our planes, all our tanks. America's wealth and military might, boy, are they have enormous prizes. Americans own America. We need to look at it as a citizen ownership model of government. Let's look at a case study. Kansas gets a little bit over 200,000 people in this model. Based off of 10 million people we move, we move 200,000 into Kansas. Kansas uh, will get about 3,000 per district. That's targeting about 55% of their districts. In the primary, Mike Amax won with 1,600 in the Democrat primary and the Republican won with 1,400. Well, with 10 million people, 3,000 for this district, 200,000 for Kansas, start with 200, I mean, two, start with um, 10 million people, 200,000 for Kansas, 3,000 per um, district for about 55% of the district to give a margin of error. There's 3,000 new ones. In the primaries, we overwhelmed by doubling the Democrat or the Republican easily. So we put all our efforts in one of them. If we allow open borders in a democracy, we freely allow our enemy, our foreign enemies, or fringe groups within America to become voting owners as well. We allow our enemy to overwhelm us in numbers, especially if they use strategy and go into the right districts. We allow our enemies an easy tactic. Milton Friedman stated that you cannot have open borders with a significant welfare state. And that's so true. However, more true and more damaging and more significant that I state that you cannot have open borders in a democracy and a weak protection of the U.S. Constitution. Again, one-fifth of one percent of the world's population is 15 million people. So one-fifth of 1% of the world's population moving here, going to the right districts, whatever they want, they get by U.S. Constitutional Amendment. Full socialism, control us, oppress us, bring back slavery and have all Americans slave to whatever by U.S. Constitutional Amendment. Would we fight back? Yes. Would we go against our Constitution legally changed to a very bad one? We would fight back. But boy, do, don't we want to secure our Constitution right now before that could even think about happening? <clears throat> so there's a lot of things we could do for strategy. I'm just going to go over a few. But take over local governments. When we move people in there, take over local governments. If you take over the zoning, say 10 people can live in one house, where right now you can't do that. Take over the registrar's office. So you can easily get people voted, I mean, registered to vote and voting and any kind of voter fraud is eliminated or any protection against voter fraud is eliminated. <coughs> Sorry. Take over the sheriffs, take over the city council, take over judges, take over other stuff, the, the elected judges I'm talking about. There's so many things you can do to make it much more difficult to fight against their efforts because they're in the positions of power that could stop voting fraud or stop this or stop that. We make election laws so the loser of primaries cannot run in the, in the general. That, that'd be huge. Take over local governments. Every state has ways for the homeless to vote. Go in there and just say you're homeless. Go back 
your vacation with your parents if you're 18 year old. Go at all college students. Just go register to vote somewhere and they then say, I'm going back to school to live on campus and you're allowed to um, vote where you want to vote. How easy would that be? Who, 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 who can guard against something like that? You move somewhere to the correct district, say you go into college, and then you mail in your vote. And you overwhelm. The Soviet Union certainly had the population to send over in the 1970s. I talked about this already. To outvote us in the Cold War. America is currently bombing other countries in the Middle East. Do you not think that they would want to send over people right into America? War fighters? Terrorists? Go, go into our schools, go into our malls, go into populated areas and start shooting it up? Bombing or whatever? North Korea and Iran are both open, openly hostile to America. Should we really have open immigration? This is not about stopping all, Ill all um, immigration. It's about stopping illegal immigration or having open immigration. The solution is a constitutional amendment. We have a lot of solutions, by the way. But have a constitutional amendment for a true 70% of Americans agreeing to an amendment. There's a lot of ways that could be done. I have one on my website. I'm not going to get into it on this video. But it's important to understand there's a lot of ways you could do this. Look at my website for that one. But if we have a system where 70% of Americans had to buy off on an amendment, right now it's 10 or 15 million, maybe even less. 70% would be 200, 230 million people having to buy off on an amendment. You're not gonna get too, too much past 230 million people unless you have open immigration Shoot, 3% of the world's population could come over and totally outvote us even at this, if we had open immigration. Because 3% of the world's population is about 200 million people. 200 million people. We have 330 million people. So all you have to do is to outvote us anyways, get over 50% of Americans. Just bring over enough Americans. I think about 150, 160 million people voted. I mean, how easy would that be for a couple percentage of the world's population just to come on over, double the size of America, and just vote in whatever they want? Even with this, we can't have open immigration. But certainly 230 million people is a lot more than 10 or 15 million people. My new ideas about competitive representative agencies I have on my website. There's a lot of ways you can do that as well. I'm not going to get into that right now, but... The way we have representation right now is very, very poor as trying to say that they're representatives. We need a better way of selecting representatives and I have it on my website. Pockets of Freedom is a way to deal with, with um, immigration concerns, especially from people with, uh, who just want to escape poverty or escape uh, oppressive, oppressive countries and oppressive dictators. Look at that. I can't get into it on this video. So a lot more to see on my website. Take a look at the 54-minute um, ones. I go a little bit more into co some, some case studies. A lot more into the strategies. Talk about a little bit more. Take a couple more deep breaths and just go over it. Until the next video.